Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Shuming Hao, the research scientist and as a greenhouse uh, plant physiologist with Agriculture Agri-Food Canada at the Hero Research and Development Center. Welcome, Dr. Hao. Uh, thank you, Fadi, for the introduction. Uh, as Fadi mentioned, I'm a physiologist with uh, Agriculture Agri-Food Canada. So basically, I try to give, uh, give you a some perspective, you know, from a physiology point of view on the AI application uh, in greenhouse uh, crop production. Oh, how you change forward? Oh, oh okay. Uh, this one? Sure. No, not moving. Try this. Okay, thank you. Uh, what I see in the greenhouse that we look at, uh, it is a complex, you know, physiological and a biological reactor. Oh, you call it system, whatever. You get so many components into it. It's a physical, you see uh, the biological, you have the crop, then you have the biological control agent, the pest. So basically you deal with both biological and the physical aspect. The whole idea is to optimize the environment that's both the physical and the biological environment so you can uh, have a good output. You know, you maximize the yield and the quality. So one of the thing is uh, with that, you have a lot of interaction among this factor. So this is a more for disease, but the insect is the similar thing. Uh, with this, the, the we is dynamic. Uh, there are a lot of interaction. When you change one factor, then there is other factor going to be affected. So when one grower, they want to make one decision. So he changed one decision. What he don't know actually affect a change of reaction, other thing. So it would be really difficult for them to see, oh, I changed this direction, affect my insect. So in the end, what it can affect is the yield and the quality you know, whether the pesticide residue even go to that part, how can you even figure out the whole chain reaction? So it's quite a complex, difficult. That's why AI is coming in. So it's, it's uh, good to handle this kind of problem. So actually you, when you make one uh, decision, one change, actually the AI is able to figure out what's the end result, right? So as a matter of fact, you see uh, AI, uh, all the controlling of agriculture is one of the best sector in agriculture for application AI. The reason is we have a lot of sensor, we have a lot of data set, and we have a high degree of control. So anything we change, we can control it, we can re realize the benefit. Uh, some of the, you know, the broader sense of AI application in the greenhouse, it can actually go back a long time ago. Uh, you know, in the 80s and the 90s, what you talk about is rule-based. It's a really early primitive, you know, the uh, primitive, that type of uh, AI. So one of the example here I show is a Harry Greenhouse manager. You see Shirley is there. You know, that's probably how, how many years, 30 years ago? Yeah. So after that, basically after 80, then you have uh, basically use the artificial neural network or fuzzy infra system. It's more for yield protection, climate protection, or part of climate control, uh, prevent uh, condensation, leaf wetness. Those are only just one component. I mean, the more recently that you have the image processing, people see the face recognition, they combine those technology with the AI basically, you know, the artificial neural network, you know, to identify disease, right? Help manage the disease. But all these thing is just just one component of it. You know, a piece meal here, there, hardly have any uh, integrate uh, approach, you know, I have this, what are gonna be overall goal is maximize my profit, environment sustainability. One thing I should mention, uh, you know, the international autonomous uh, challenge, I think I can gonna talk a little bit more in the, uh, later. That's actually, I should give them credit, they held in the Netherlands. 
actually with that challenge actually help people to think in that way, how can you integrate the approach? You the integrate approach really focus our output, the end goal, maximize profit, maximize the resource use efficiency. So when we deal with an integrated uh, AI control system, we need to use a lot of domain knowledge. Uh, a lot of traditional one, uh, like the AI, you know, the only thing that I have a big data set, I try to do that, you know, just like open AI, they have an enormous data bit. They have a billion of dollars, right? But we don't have that kind of resource. So we need to uh, actually use as much domain knowledge, existing the expert knowledge as much possible. Luckily uh, for controlling agriculture, you know, we have a lot of those knowledge, a lot of those model uh, available. So those one, then you combine the data mining, you know, the machine learning. So then we can develop the AI agent, you know, to use for the greenhouse application. Whatever the point I want to emphasize, is uh, the AI application is continuously involving process. So as we get more data, better algorithm, it will be getting better and better every day. Uh, the other thing is important is, uh, you know, uh, we want to accurate data, right? Good data set. <laughs> you know, Kai will emphasize a lot, I think later, you know, because you only give the good, good data set if the AI algorithm can come up a uh, good decision, you feed them better data, you mess them up. Uh, as a physiologist, actually, that's my point of interest. I want to emphasize plant-based automatic growth monitor based control. One thing is you can see all the, your physical environment, your climate setting, even if the same, you see here, we get a different uh, lighting, then you get a different temperature. So you need a plant based like a monitor system to de detect those part. To be more specifically, uh, you see even uh, just a small part of a change in plant temperature can affect the plant a lot. Uh, you see that one, uh, uh, I think on my side here is on the left side of the screen. You see those one is the same air and the plant head temperature. When you increase, you get a uniform increase in growth. But on the, the right hand side, uh, you see uh, the plant temperature keep at 22, but you only increase the body temperature, you know, from 18 to 26, what you get is a more generative plants. So just change the body temperature, only that tiny point. So you get a more leaf, but a smaller leaf. So the point is we need a plant-based control. That's all for me for today. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Howe. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Kenneth Tran, uh, founder and CEO of Coidra. Thanks, Ken. Thank you, Fadi, for the introduction, and uh, thank you, uh, Siu Ming, for leading to my part of the presentation. Uh, for those who don't already know about me, I'm the CEO of Quadra. Quadra is a, a, a technology co co company. I used to work at Microsoft Research. I, so my background is I, I, I study applied mathematics and physics uh, for my PhD. And so I, I learned a lot of traditional science before I got into the machine learning. And in 2012, I joined Microsoft Research working in machine learning. Uh, it, and at the time, machine learning and AI were just start, starting to, to bloom. Uh, before getting into the uh, uh, indoor farming or greenhouse uh, cultivation, uh, we actually tried to, to apply our research towards energy uh, control for the Microsoft data centers. And then uh, I, uh, on an occasion, I saw a vertical farm inside the Microsoft uh, cafe and it's thought that it was interesting. So that was 2017. And that's how I, I got started into uh, indoor growing. In 2018, uh, there was a, a competition in the Netherlands 
I actually uh, uh, visited Wageningen University and research there first, just talking about broad research collaboration. And then they mentioned that challenge. And then, and then I said, okay, okay, we will do it. And then later, I, 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 I reached out to uh, Siu Ming because the competition was on cucumbers. And then I, I reached out to, okay, I need to collaborate with the best cucumber experts <laughs> on planet uh, for, for, the, for this competition. So that's how I, uh, I got to know uh, Siu Ming and, and Charlie. So uh, our journey uh, started then. In 2020, uh, I left Microsoft and I started the company Coidra. So that's the background about myself. So uh, why am I here? Uh, so we, so Coidra has demonstrated a few successes in both public uh, competitions as well as commercial results uh, that we are going to talk about uh, with Greg Lex and, and Mark and also provide some of his remarks. Um, so uh, th that's why I'm here. And uh, before I, I dive into the the AI and the autonomous growing, the technicalities. I just want to give you some flavor about what Quadra does. So AI is very broad. Autonomous greenhouse can also be very broad. So, so what do we do actually? So we don't provide robotics. We don't provide automation. We don't try to uh, change uh, the climate computers like Breva, Hogendorn, uh, Reader, etc. So we provide a new kind of software that integrates with the uh, climate uh, controllers uh, with the purpose of uh, making the climate control smarter, more efficient with the ultimate goal of uh, producing uh, more uh, with less and make the whole systems uh, more scalable, more autonomous so that the uh, growers or the operators or the decision makers can focus on the less tedious task. Um, and assuming uh, 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 described uh, nowadays, uh, growing is no longer just irrigation based on, uh, on the schedule anymore. Growing is getting more complex. Uh, it, it is more like running a factory nowadays with so many uh, 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 decisions to be made on a real-time basis. So that's why we, uh, uh, we provide uh, the, uh, the, our optimal control technology for, for the controlled environment agriculture. So let me uh, give you a quick uh, flavor about like some of like just an example of how we do it differently. This is uh, an example of a traditional method for climate control before. Uh, and it was very much rule-based, uh, like uh, Siu Ming explained. And this is just an, a, a tiny example of a rule-based, uh, which is also common. Uh, so you have a rule saying that if the, if the outdoor radiation is less than a certain threshold, then you, okay, then, then you, you, you look at the temperature. And if the temperature is less, is, if the uh, outside radiation is low and the temperature is also low, you turn on the light. Otherwise, you, you don't. So that is an example for lighting control. And uh, this is in machine learning. This is called uh, in machine learning or data processing in general. This is called a decision tree. So what? Uh, mach so machine learning is not really something that is entirely different. It takes it can start with the decision tree as a baseline, but instead of trying to learn all the decision points or the branching of the decision tree, it tries to, to, to grow and develop a decision, a decision tree uh, from the data. So why 300 uh, watt? Or why do we split at the, uh, at the, at the, at the outside radiation or at the temperature? So those things can be learned uh, by uh, with uh, machine learning. And there's a method in machine learning called decision tree or random forest or boosted uh, uh, decision trees. Uh, we are about just taking this as a baseline and trying to make it uh, more automated and, and better. Uh, our approach at a very high level is more uh, holistic than that. Uh, uh, so this is another view of what Siu Ming showed you earlier. 
with uh, the continuous feedback loop. So we have data sources coming from, uh, we have data coming from uh, many sources. Uh, one could be from the climate computer. Another one could be from new sensors that you just have installed. Like you have a SAP uh, flow sensor that uh, is not uh, integrated in the, in the climate computer. You may have yield data, which is not uh, stored in the climate computer. So you have data coming from uh, different sources and we have uh, an engine uh, which is called physics uh, informed machine learning or physics informed neural network. Uh, this is an emerging trend within the machine learning community itself. So if you search, if you Google for physics informed neural networks, there are many uh, search results or PINN. So we Coidra actually pioneered this trend. Uh, actually, I started working on this back when I was at uh, uh, Microsoft. So the idea is on one hand, we have a lot of domain knowledge. We have a lot of people like Xiuming, Shaoling, and uh, include even Mark. So how can we, uh, and then on another camp, we have uh, data science, we have machine learning, some uh, a, a new technologies. Do we have to choose one versus the other? Or, how, or, or can we combine the, the advantage of all of those? So each agent, each individual, or each data source contributes something meaningful, something uh, positive to, to our uh, intelligent systems. So that's how we came up with the idea of physics informed uh, machine learning, which combines both. Basically we uh, represent our machine learning model first as a process-based mechanistic model, but we, we we over parameterize it, make it having more parameters and, and using data to, to, to fine tune the, uh, the parameters. So this will constitute uh, well, what is known as the digital twin. So the role of the digital twin is to analyze online real-time data. So actually there are two phases. One phase is the, uh, the historical data analysis to, 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 do, uh, to come up with a model. And then during the uh, during the real time operational phase, it processes uh, the data, real time data, and tries and 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 helps the optimization uh, component to reason about if we do this, then what is going to be the outcome? Uh, uh, and it's not just about the five minutes decision making, but if we this is the trajectory of our climate control actions, what is going to be the effect on the long term photosynthesis? Or, or the long-term uh, uh, energy cost or long-term cost or revenue components. So uh, what we are also working on is making the engine really uh, flexible uh, and generic by, al uh, by allowing a users to input the business target as a formula. So uh, you may, uh, someone here may care about yield, uh, but another one may care about uh, uh, cost reduction. So uh, different uh, companies have different objectives, uh, but they can all be uh, for, uh, formulated as, as, uh, as a function. So uh, our engine uh, can take in generic functions and try to, to optimize against that objective function. Uh, so this is something that I have already uh, talked about. So we have, uh, on one hand, we have, like, and, and I'm going to, to, to repeat this, uh, reiterate this, because this is really important and it's core uh, within our AI framework, because to a lot of people, like when they think of AI, they think of something uh, new and magical, or something that they don't understand, but it can be very simple. So one hand, we have the humans, we have the domain experts, and we, we, we can do reasoning. We, yeah. uh, but uh, the disadvantage, uh, the weakness of the humans is that we are unable to sit at the computer all the time and doing a, a lot of data analysis, like real-time data. We have so many real-time data points. So how can we uh, process all of these data points and react uh, quickly? So that is the advantage of the machine. The machines can analyze huge amounts of data and to find uh, correlations 
finding statistical uh, patterns and, and very can, can relearn very quickly from new data points. Uh, but the mach but machines by itself is very poor at adaptability to certain change, like to the Black Swan events. And uh, a lot of people who uh, talk about AI and machine learning, they focus too uh, they focus too much on just the data. But uh, people tend to forget that we humans uh, uh, have come up with reasons with uh, physical laws through thousands of years of evolution and, and education. So uh, let's say the energy balance, the energy balance is something that we, we all know, but the energy balance is actually the distilled knowledge through uh, thousands of years of observing physics. And that is not something that you can learn easily by just looking at the one or few years of uh, the, the climate data in, inside a greenhouse. So we just if you look at just the climate computer, you cannot reason, you cannot uh, uh, infer uh, at the energy balance laws. So our uh, AI approach is really combining those, but in a, in a mathematical and principled uh, framework. So that is a snapshot about our uh, technical, uh, technical approach towards uh, optimal control and, and, and uh, uh, climate uh, decision making in general. Uh, in practice, here are the, key, uh, the ongoing challenge uh, uh, with the industry uh, that we are trying to solve. Uh, one is the shortage of the skilled laborers and the, the the, the shortage of the head growers of the uh, uh, of the engineers who uh, who who know how to grow with the engine like the growers with the engineering mindset, we uh, I think that there's a shortage of labor in general uh, with harvester with people who who know how to do uh, crop care etc. But I think that we even lack more of the uh, the growers who know how to make decisions based on science, based on physics, based on crop modeling. And, and, and because uh, we uh, don't have many educational programs geared towards uh, that role. And uh, usually engineers, they, uh, who are very well-trained, they tend to go work in other more uh, uh, sexy industries. Another uh, is the operate like even with the good uh, cultivation engineers, we still have a lot of operational in inefficiency due to a lot of manual work. For example, even if you know everything about the plants and, and crop production, you can just you you cannot just sit at a computer and doing the manual change. You are you are still held uh, 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 slave by the by the by the legacy uh, uh, user interface of the climate computer. Uh, for example. And uh, another challenge is about the data management, how to combine uh, multiple data silos together so that you only, you only need to work with one system, one, uh, one platform, one data platform and not having to, uh, and let's say you have uh, uh, the, the yield management system here, the ERB there and the climate computer here, and uh, and you don't know how to how how they how to make them communicate how to co-optimize those systems together. Um, I'm going to skip this one because uh, it's just a repeat of what I have already talked about about the about our approach approach of combining uh, multiple disciplines together. <clears throat> so next um, in. Uh, 2021, uh, uh, we, collabor uh, we collaborated with uh, Greg Lex uh, Greenhouses, uh, re represented by Mark here, uh, and also with uh, the Harrow Research Center. And we received a grant uh, to, to work on the, uh, to apply the uh, autonomous growing tech to a real commercial greenhouse. Uh, uh, and this is our, uh, deployment roadmap. Uh, first, we uh, work. Uh, we ne we needed to work on the integration with the legacy control systems, and in this case, it's the uh, Hogan Dawn system, uh, Hogan uh, Hogan Dawn climate computer, 
since then, we have integrated with all of the climate computers and not just Hogan drone. And then we also worked on the greenhouse setup, how to do, uh, how, for example, setting up a wall to divide the greenhouse into two zones for uh, uh, proper uh, AB comparisons. We also uh, needed to ensure that all the actuators could be controlled independently by each uh, component. And then uh, we deployed, the, we evolved, deployed uh, our autopilot uh, uh, system. Uh, and we, we uh, together with Greg Lex, we have run uh, two different trials into, uh, into greenhouses. And each greenhouse has two compartments for the AB comparison. So in total, we experimented on four compartments at Greg Lex, two compartments for, uh, for eggplant and two compartments for uh, cucumbers. Uh, on the eggplant, uh, the, the eggplant trial lasted from April 19th to October 25th of last year, and it was fun. It was partially funded by uh, by the GCII uh, 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 grant that Fadi already mentioned. Uh, and in this case, the, we calculated the set points every five minutes. Uh, let me see if there's any. Okay, so we will talk about the results later. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to skip this and we can go back to the products. Let me see. And uh, for the cucumber trials, uh, th there were two compartments and one about one acre each. Um, and, and uh, we control the heating, the CO2 and the venting. At the time, uh, so just last year, uh, Greg Lex was uh, installing a new uh, LED system. Uh, so due to the tight integration, because uh, what is special about Greg Lex is that they also control their uh, power generation. Uh, so, uh, um, so, so for this first trial, we didn't get to control the light yet, but we'll, we will later. So with just three uh, uh, control parameters, we were able to increase the yield uh, by 19.6% uh, compared to the uh, yield performance in uh, zone 15. So the yield in zone 14 was 15.9 kilogram per square meters within that trial period and 13.7 kilogram per square meters in zone 15. Uh, I don't know what, uh, oh, this is, sorry, this is the uh, re results from the eggplant trial that I, I actually uh, uh, skipped. The increase in the eggplant trial was even higher, 28.5%. Uh, and as you can see from the graph, the yield, the, the productivity gain was uh, consistent from the start to the end. Uh, uh, the black line represents uh, the the uh, the incremental yield uh, from the AI control system, and the green uh, plot shows the yield from the the uh, the compared zone. Uh, and I want to also uh, uh, repeat that the the lighting controls was the same for both zones, uh, and lighting is. Uh, the most energy intensive uh, component well, among all the cost components. So by increasing the yield, we also increase the energy efficiency as well. So not just the yield. Uh, another case study that I also would like to talk about is our recent success in the autonomous greenhouse challenge uh, just last year. I initially worked, uh, collaborated with Shaling and Xiuming on the 2000, uh, on the autonomous greenhouse challenge back in 2018. We won that challenge and we repeated uh, that success in uh, in the challenge uh, in 2021 as well as 2022. So I want to talk about the 2022 challenge. Um, so the goal of the uh, of the autonomous greenhouse challenge in general is twofold. One is the autonomy. So can we automate all the tedious decision makings by humans uh, uh, with uh, AI? 
and the second uh, and the second objective is productivity okay automation is good but can it be efficient can the ai make our produ crop production more productive uh, that that is the second goal of the challenge and there were two phases phase one was the online challenge in 2021 uh, we competed against uh, 46 teams from 24 countries. We collaborated with professors from Cornell universities and also Rutgers, and we won that challenge. Uh, and we repeated uh, our success in the real growing challenge in, uh, uh, in, uh, in last year. Um, there were, so in the real growing challenge, there were five AI teams uh, competing with each other and also with a reference compartment uh, controlled by by an expert, uh, by actually by two experts, uh, Dutch growers. Uh, so our approach towards our approach in that challenge and the same approach uh, when we applied uh, at uh, Greg Lex is following. We have basically uh, a lot of people ask, okay, what is the secret sauce? Well, the secret sauce is to have a robust full stack system. Just like in manufacturing, just like in every systems, the key to, to success is to have robustness and stability. Uh, and, every and, and everything should work uh, well together. Uh, it's not just about just one thing. So in order to, uh, 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 to do so, we worked on, on, on the three components for our, uh, within our system, uh, this also constitutes our uh, software products. We have the IoT suite. The role of the IoT suite is to ingest the data from multiple sources, visualize the data, monitor the data, make sure that things uh, 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 are within the, the right balance. Uh, we, the IoT suite also handles the missing data. And here, and these are the boring details that we growers tend to not talk about. For example, how to, some data is noisy. Sometimes you have missing data. So how can we develop a system that is robust to all of those uh, instability? And uh, the power sensor is noisy because sometimes depending on the cloud, on the cloudiness and also your greenhouse structure, the uh, power uh, sensor as an example, it may go up and down crazily. So uh, can we, so, so we, we need to handle the, the, the noisy data. We need to do the data stabilization and data smoothing. And then we have the digital twin. The digital twin uh, is uh, uh, basically uh, text all the data and they do the reasoning uh, and simulation and can tell us what is the current uh, transpiration rate, the photosynthetic rate, and the real-time plant growth. Uh, and the digital twin also has the purpose of feeding the autopilot doing the planning, uh, helping the autopilot doing the planning and optimization. Uh, within the autonomous greenhouse challenge context, we had uh, more control parameters compared to the, uh, to the trials at Greglex last year. Uh, we could control the temperature, the, um, the, uh, the lighting used uh, with LED, dimmability as well, heating, CO2, and also uh, there were some uh, interesting uh, 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 novelty. So uh, in, uh, when we grow uh, lettuce, we could also control the plant density in real time. So... Here's the results. Uh, we out so within uh, so in this challenge we outperformed the reference Dutch growers by 27.8 percent in profit, uh, and that was uh, a, a, a very big uh, increase uh, in profitability. So uh, because I'm. Uh, my time is, is up, so I'm going to, to pause here, and I would like to, I, I welcome you to, 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 to ask questions later, and uh, you can also send me emails uh, uh, if you want to see uh, demos and how we actually do it uh, in, at a more detailed level uh, later. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ken.
Um, our next speaker is uh, Quay Digweed, a greenhouse engineer with uh, Agriculture Agri-Food Canada's Haro Research and Development Centre. And he'll be talking to us a little bit about the uh, sensors used in the project. Great. Thanks, Fadi. Okay, actually, I'll finish off with, uh, Ken, I'll start off with Ken's slide here, talking about his sensor stack used for this project. Uh, so my role in the project at Great Lakes Greenhouse was integrating new sensors into Ken, uh, Ken's uh, crop manager system. Um, this is a solution that developed out of that and some of the growing pains we had getting the project started. Uh, so Ken's groups developed a, um, a LoRaWAN gateway, so a, a long range um, wireless technology to deal with some of the pains we had at Great Lakes. So taking scientific grade sensors, integrating them into a data point that makes it easier to collect data and um, move, it in your, move it into Crop Manager for Coidre AI. Um, so it's sensor agnostic. You can connect any kind, of, any kind of sensor you want up to it, and it transmits that over a robust wireless signal. Um, for our uh, setup in Great Lakes, uh, you can see here we started out with a, uh, with a PLC, so Programmable Logic Controller as our first data collector. Uh, we had, for that project, uh, we had to look at adding sensors to Great Lakes in addition to what was already available. So in a commercial range, there might be one um, aspirator box controlling a whole acre. Uh, we want to expand on that, get some higher density data, uh, measure trouble spots where you might have issues that arise from a more aggressive control strategy. So we looked at measuring temperature, humidity, radiation, CO2, and irrigation with our sensor mix. Uh, for air temperature, uh, going over some options, I'm not going to give specific suggestions. Um, so for air temperature, you can use RTDs, thermistors, uh, sometimes there's some digital sensors with integrated circuits. I really want to drive home if you're adding temperature sensors to a greenhouse, then you have to be aspirated. Otherwise, you're just measuring how hot you, the enclosure gets from the sun. Um, so that adds some challenges to installing sensors everywhere. If you're adding a fan, then you're having to look at how that you're powering that fan all the time. You can't run off a battery. If you're looking at solar power or you're looking at uh, wired. Uh, you can see here we, we ended up for Great Lakes, we ended up using Apogee uh, sensors. And then we also want some plant specific sensors as well. So we're looking at uh, for this project infrared cameras, thermocouples, uh, thermal piles. So thermal piles let you measure solar radiation. Uh, for, if you're measuring plant temperatures, you want to go with no contact sensors. Uh, of course, looking at radiation, uh, we want to consider PAR, so photosynthetically active radiation, where you'd measure that in your greenhouse. Uh, you also want to consider um, long uh, long wave infrared radiation, and we. At Great Lakes, we did that with a net radiometer. So basically, it's an upward-facing pyranometer paired with a downward-facing pyranometer. So you can measure the radiation coming into your greenhouse, radiation leaving your greenhouse. So you can get um, information that informs that energy balance Ken was talking about. So that can help you inform decisions. Say you're using curtains. Um, it could help you decide when to open or close your curtains at night. It could help you decide um, how, how, much, um, how much to increase your lighting target based on the temperature target you can expect for the rest of the day. Uh, and then... Specifically, I want to mention PAR meters here. Uh, we also used so Apogee uh, bar sensors. We didn't just use spot sensors that helps that helps deal with some of that noisiness Ken was talking about. And uh, especially at Great Lakes, when Ken uh, wasn't controlling the lights directly, he needed a way to, to read what the lights were doing to help inform his other, uh, other set points. So we had a, a PAR sensor at the head of the canopy and a PAR sensor lower down in the canopy. Uh, so you could see the light integrated, basically the light being absorbed by the leaves and then the light lower down in the canopy. Uh, CO2, um, we went with infrared sensors. One cautioning, cautionary point here, if you're using CO2 sensors, uh, a lot of them have a self-calibration feature that runs at night. Make sure that's turned off in a greenhouse. You'll get, you'll get er erroneous readings because you'll, it'll self-calibrate to 400 ppm and greenhouses can, go, can be above that. If you're adding supplemental CO2, it'll falsely calibrate. It's one of the issues to keep an eye out for if you're using um, sensors not provided by your greenhouse uh, controls company. So adding, adding new equipment in, be concerned about uh, any potential self-calibrations. Uh, for water at Great Lakes, we measured irrigation EC, pH, leach EC, and leach pH. Uh, we did not use selected ion sensors, but there's something to keep an eye out for as they become available. So you could measure nutrient solution composition. Um, one of the challenges we had at Great Lakes uh, with the eggplant range was it's an organic range. And so measuring leach EC and pH, measuring irrigation EC and pH was, uh, was a challenge. I uh, ended up not being a uh, controlled factor for the experiment, given the uh, lack of sensitivity to it. But the sensors, uh, it's something to keep, keep an eye on uh, for long-term trends in your, in your crop. Uh, really want to focus here 
on sensor density and placement. So if you're working with a company, not necessarily Toydra, but any, any uh, controls company, you want to be considering where you're measuring um, your sensor density and the placement. So um, Ken's talked before about uh, garbage in, garbage out for data. You want to make sure you're measuring something where it's relevant to your crops. So you want to be taking measurements at the head of the ca crop canopy. And if the sensors are somewhere else, you want to make sure your control system knows that that's not a head measurement. That's a, that might be a lower canopy measurement. And you're concerned about uh, condensation that could lead to disease. Um, another thing to consider, especially when you're putting new sensors in, uh, how are they getting powered? Are they battery powered? You put them anywhere. Uh, do they need wireless access? Do they need a Ethernet run? Do they need a do they need, do they need a 120 volt outlet? Can really affect your install costs. Um, while you're trying to measure them for, and then greenhouse uniformity too. So if you're measuring in a range, you traditionally want to measure centrally. But if you know you have a problem spot and you're concerned about disease or pest uh, and it pops up in a problem spot, it might be worth putting a sensor there and making sure your control system knows that's a special sensor we're using it to observe for leaf wetness, or we're using it to observe for anomalies that might be causing our causing our issue there. Um, just quickly go over your considerations if you were to pick sensors yourself to integrate. Um, so you have your analog signals, generally you're measuring voltage, resistor, or current in some way. It's being correlated back to an environmental measurement. So classic is a pyranometer. They produce a voltage that's correlated to uh, or calibrated to uh, a watts per meter square output. Uh, challenge if you put these in a high density range, a high density in a, in a range, uh, you're going to have voltage drops on long wire runs to consider. So you have to measure your wire resistance. Uh, and something like a current signal is going to consume more power. So it might not work on a battery battery system. Digital signals, um, more standard. So you look at your Modbus signal. Uh, you see your RS-485 or 332. You might also see SDI-12 signals, which is uh, common for field meteorology. So our, for this project, our irrigation sensors were SDI-12. Uh, they're easy to integrate with data loggers, but they're um, pretty low data rate. So if you wanted to measure something quickly, they might not be the best choice. Um, other sensors that you might come across if you were looking for digital signals, you'll see lots of I2C sensors. They're really nice. They're really inexpensive. But that's not a signal you want to be using in a greenhouse without converting it in some way, say, through uh, Ken's uh, LoRaWAN system. Basically, they're, they're meant for circuit board to circuit board transmission, not long distance in a greenhouse. That's where something like a hub comes in. Um, just to wrap up in summary, just keep an eye on this. And if you're going to look at putting an AI system in or putting in any kind of advanced control system, have a conversation with the uh, in, with your climate control computer company. Have a conversation with your growers. If they have operations managers on site that are doing the installation, talk to them. Make sure it's feasible, and then have a clear clear cost and clear goal in mind before you uh, start start buying equipment. Thanks, Wade. Our next speaker is uh, Mark Weimer. Uh, Research and Business Development Manager at Great Lakes uh, Greenhouse, and he'll give us his uh, perspective on the project. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Mark Reimer. I just want to first thank you, uh, start with some thanks. Uh, first, Fatty and Omafra and OGVG for uh, hosting this presentation, as well as our funding partners <clears throat> with the ISO and uh, GCII. Um, also, uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Zooming Howe, um, Quay Digweed, and um, Shalin, Shalin Kosa, as well as uh, Koidra, our partners in this, this project, uh, Ken, Don, and Katut. And of course, my uh, our operations manager um, uh, Ryan Bellaflor, who was uh, absolutely integral to uh, having this uh, pr this uh, project uh, uh, get integrated onto site. So, brief history: Great Lakes has been around since uh, 1983. The owner is Paul Dick. Uh, he purchases one 2.5 acres greenhouse. has expanded to uh, 120 acres now. Uh, we specialize in uh, long English cucumbers as well as. Uh, have started doing a lot of uh, mini cucumbers as well as organic eggplant, organic peppers, and um, organic tomatoes. Um, this this kind of this program kind of came out of uh, kind of left field for us. We were one day, uh, Dr. Zooming House said, "Hey, can I have a meeting with you guys? Um, I have a gentleman from Seattle, Microsoft, who would like to talk to you about uh, a, a a project that they're that they're working on. And Great Lakes being uh, forward thinking in in everything they do." was uh, more than happy to uh, have Koidra come in and uh, pitch their idea. So after a couple of uh, quick weeks of discussion and uh, grant funding proposals, we were able to put together this uh, this project um, uh, for, for trial space. Um, 
there was, um, I, I, we threw Ken quite a few curveballs. I know along the way, uh, we started off with the idea of doing some, some cucumbers um, in a trial space that was working well for us. And then you know, there's organic, oh, and then there's organic eggplant. So um, it just goes a lot to say about how Coidra was, uh, was flexible and able to, um, you know, really look at, uh, you know, kind of the needs of, of an older greenhouse, uh, unique greenhouse, um, something that was very unique for Great Lakes is, you know, we have, uh, everything is very customizable. So uh, everything in our greenhouse is customized. Um, and uh, Coidra was able to uh, come in, look at the, you know, basically look at our setup without, there was definitely some, uh, some long days and nights of looking through all the different ways of uh, you know, Coidra and Ken and, and, and Quaid being able to uh, to craft uh, their sensors and, and work within this greenhouse, which, you know, had just a lot of, lot of just a lot of different um, ways of, uh, you know, unique, unique aspects to overcome. Uh, so uh, it was, it was a, it was quite a, an effort. And then you throw COVID in there uh, and the inability for some of our, uh, our American partners to come over and travel. So it was, uh, it was, it was quite a project to get through, but, uh, yeah, uh, as a whole, uh, I guess what I can say, um, for the most part is, is, is Coidra was, was fundamental in, in really offering a customized solution for us. Um, we're still like the, with the reported, um, yield results, uh, we're, we're really looking forward to, uh, you know, kind of going through this process again with them. Uh, we have uh, plans to expand, not from, from we started with, with eggplant, we moved into some mini cucumbers and we're also looking at, uh, uh, looking to expand the project even further into a more, say, modern greenhouse uh, with uh, more control aspects, dimmable lighting. Um, we had some challenges with, uh, with, with our, our uh, energy production at one point where we, we, were, we lost some of those components that we were really hoping to capture with, with the lighting. But, uh, you know, regardless of that, uh, Coidra was still able to put together a, um, uh, you know, a result that uh, was uh, was positive. Um, the user platform, uh, our growers, uh, you know, it, 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 there's a lot of information on on the on the user platform. The the additional group of sensors that uh, that Coidra offers has actually helped us identify a few few uh, gaps within the greenhouse. Uh, kind of very early in the in the uh, in the in the project, we identified that there was a, a CO2 sensor or a CO2 valve that wasn't operational, uh, which was a bit of a surprise to us. But um, you know that was the the tech that was the additional you know redundant sensors that uh, that Coidra offered that was we were able to identify that and then address it right because it's a, it's a key component of our growing and uh, yeah we, we we that was a right there that was a a big <laughs> a big win for the project but the uh, the platform that uh, Coidra uses um, the growers tell me that it's a uh, fairly friendly to work with they they like the the graphic interface uh, Coidra has been very uh, open to um, uh, any any of the uh, the uh, uh, suggestions that the growers have had for information that they're looking for, um, that's all available to us. Um, yeah, so uh, for, for the most part, or probably our, I would outside of going through the nuances of, of the greenhouse itself, being an older older facility or where we started the program, um, you know, of course, uh, I'm going to say grower integration into technology like this is always a little bit of a challenge. I'm sure any of the growers here or online uh, would agree that uh, just getting comfortable and trusting something that's making decisions for you uh, is is, uh, is something that uh, the growers have learned to you know accept when they're when they're looking at it they're they're they're, they're evaluating um, you know the coidra as a tool and not as a uh, competition or as a uh, necessarily a replacement but it, it gives them the opportunity to um, uh, you know, look at the information and the data and in, in, in the management uh, aspect of the program and, um, you know, uh, really uh, use, view it as a tool, uh, as something that they can use uh, going forward. So that would be a, probably one of our larger challenges as well. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm here to answer any questions. Anything else uh, anyone would have to have? Okay. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um... Before I uh, end the recording here, I just wanted to thank uh, all of our um, speakers today, um, and we'll take uh, take questions here as soon as I stop the recording.